Heard mine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. As Teddy said, I'm uh, Jeff Bliss. I'm senior editor over at the Capitol Forum, and it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, moderate this first panel, which is going to be on the history and the business uh, of breakups. And uh, we are going to go into, I mean, there's, there's a lot of debate over whether breakup's a good idea or a bad idea. No doubt you'll hear some opinions about that this morning. But mostly what we're going to focus on is kind of what history uh, has told us about you know, when we actually, breakups have actually happened, if they've gone well, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what are kind of some of the laws, the principles, the philosophies that um, should be things that we should be thinking about now in the present case. So uh, I'm just going to cut right to the chase right now. We obviously have three leading thinkers on antitrust joining me this morning. Uh, they don't need an introduction, I'm going to give you a brief one for everybody. Uh, we have John Newman, who is a University of Miami uh, uh, School of Law professor who was previously served as the deputy uh, uh, director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. I'm not doing this in order, I guess, you're in the middle. <laughs> Next to me is Christina Kafara, who uh, most recently is an econo uh, expert economist economists at the University College London and CEPR Competition Research Policy Network. And of course, on the end, we have Barry Lynn, who's Executive Director of the Open Markets um, Institute. So thank you all for um, joining me today. And um, I'm just going to start off with a basic question about, uh, I think, again, my, my knowledge of this is, is, is small compared to you guys. But I, I mean, since back to at least 1911, we have uh, a history of breakups in this country. Would you say, John, we'll start with you, that there's actually been a golden age of breakups, so to speak, in this country? Uh, well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to give the short answer first, not in typical professorial fashion, but I'll get into a longer answer in a second. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, before I jump in, though, if I could, I'd like to take just a second to thank Teddy for setting the scene here. Um, I remember being at a conference where we were talking about Google and antitrust in 2016, and there were not a lot of people there. But among them were, I think, Lena Khan, Jonathan Cantor, I think Matt Stoller was there. Um, so Capital Forum's always been, at least in my experience, at the absolute bleeding edge of these issues. So it was, it was particularly, I think, exciting for me to get a chance to look backwards, because usually Capital Forum's way ahead of me. Um, but this, this is a great question, right? Because this is not our first rodeo in the US trying to wrangle a big monopoly. Um, our history with, with attacking monopolies and issuing serious orders, like um, what they used to call the three Ds, divestiture, dissolution, and divorcement, goes back even further than 1911. I mean, the courts were ordering companies to dissolve trust to dissolve back before 1911. That said, I think you can kind of think of our history in kind of three periods. There's an early kind of flurry of activity that culminates in 1911 with American tobacco, Standard Oil, some pretty famous breakups. Um, and then there's kind of a dead period, 1920s, early 1930s, really don't see much action. Uh, macroeconomic conditions obviously driving that, I think. And then you see the closest thing to a golden age that we've ever had, and that starts in the mid-1930s and probably extends through about 1970, maybe tapering off. And then you see this last gasp with the AT&T uh, consent decree in eight, uh, 1982. Even that heyday, though, I would say is not a golden age, really. You know, when you look back at these, um, the history of breakups during this age, there were a lot of them. Uh, the, over the first 100 years of the Sherman Act's history, there were something like 95 monopolization cases that led to a triple D type order right, a structural type order. And of those, the majority, two thirds were breakups of some sort. Um, there was a mixed results though, right? A lot of the cases, in my mind, didn't go far enough. So in a case like uh, Standard Oil, broke up a bunch of companies but left them with common stock ownership. We've learned now that's probably not a great idea. Um, and it broke up basically regional monopolies, so it left little monopolies. I think that's a mistake. Um, but there have been some successes too. I would point to cases like Paramount, where you saw really effective um, um, divestitures ordered, a structural separation uh, at a vertical level, right? So you can't operate at two levels, and a horizontal breakup as well, right? That's a serious order. Um, and it, it really shook up the industry, paved the way for a lot of competition. 
Um, it's not the only success story. And even the partial successes, I would say, are probably better than the alternative. I think Christina could probably speak to this from <laughs> firsthand experience. It, behavioral orders can really fall short with these companies. So even some partial successes, things like the, the Pullman breakup, not one we talk about a lot today, um, had some good effects, right? Now, it left one of the monopolies intact. That's a mistake. But it at least made the world, made the markets work better than they had been before the order was issued. Um, even better, when I started looking back at the aftermath of these decrees, there seems to be little to no downside, even from the company's perspective. So usually a, a triple D type order during this period did not cause stock prices to tank, didn't drive the company out of business. There's some scattered examples of that. But oftentimes a divestiture order had no effect on the stock price. Sometimes it even caused the stock price to jump. American Tobacco is a great example. I mean, that was a serious order. Broke up a company into three different ones. Ordered the firm to create a new company. Liggett and Myers didn't exist before. I mean, that's a far-reaching order. Stock price jumped on the news. Right? That's not a huge downside as far as I can tell. Um, and I think also, you know, what you see when you read back through some of the opinions is this type of case, this type of order can send a message. You can tell the judges no that what they're doing is serious business. It's democratic business, lower D, right? They're sending a message to the American people that, hey, these corporations aren't, they aren't just some, you know, delicate creature that exists in a state of nature and we should be very ginger before we reach into that magical space. No, 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 I think they, they spoke with a confidence and I think it was a confidence that was earned by experience, right? Um, again, it wasn't always a success, but oftentimes it was. If I could close out on this initial point with just one, one quote. This was from Justice Stewart. Um, he was writing in a Clayton Act Section 7 case, but I think the point stands. Um, what he said was this. While divestiture remedies have not enjoyed spectacular success in the past, remedies short of divestiture have been uniformly unsuccessful in meeting the goals of the act. And that's kind of the attitude I come away from studying antitrust history of breakups with is, hey, it, we don't always get it perfectly right, but even a partial win is better than a loss. Barry, do you want to uh, follow in on that? Uh, your thoughts on that? What, what do you think? Does John have a point that even a, you know, even if they get partially, right, that's better than nothing? Um, oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I could not agree more. Uh, I mean, I think the what I'm going to add on this is, um, you know, I think there's a there's an issue here that has been percolating in the background um, and uh, in in, in across uh, sort of this discussion in the United States and, 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 and in Europe, um, which is, should be part of this discussion about remedies, which is that what we're talking about here are communications infrastructure. You know, that's like the, the platforms, the dominant platforms are, you know, the 21st century version of AT&T. We're going to hear about AT&T. And uh, one of the things, if you go back and look at AT&T, it's not just the 1982 case. It's not just like, you know, separating long distance from, from local. It's not chopping the, you know, the, the, the baby bells, you know, chopping out the baby bells. It's, uh, it, it, was the, it was coming in as a, 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 a infrastructure that was covered by common carrier rules by, uh, uh, you know, sort of versions of, uh, you know, non-discrimination rules. And this is something that we have absolutely forgotten about in this country. We've been relearning how to use the broad acts. You know, it's like we finally figured out, oh my God, there's a thing called the Sherman Act. You know, it's like Bork and company, uh, you know, uh, 40 years ago, they stuck it, they, they dug a hole and they buried the ax and we've dug up the ax. And it's really exciting to run around with the ax and think about <laughs> what we are going to chop up. But the thing about, it's not just chopping things up in this way, it's actually the, the traditions of American antitrust and a monopoly is to chop away the license to use power of any essential facility. And that should absolutely be part of this conversation. We forget that in, 19, in, in 1890 is the Sherman Act. Three years before the Sherman Act was the Interstate Commerce Act. The Sherman Act stood on the foundation of the Interstate Commerce Act. The Interstate Commerce Act, the purpose of the Interstate Commerce Act was to take away the power of the 
network platforms of that time, the most powerful corporations anyone had seen up to that time, the railroads, to favor certain people and disfavor others, to sort of control the access to the market, to extort people to get to market, to, to, to make people grovel in order to get to market, extort money and voice and political power from individuals and from communities and from the nation as a whole. So that was the, that was the foundation of modern federal anti-monopoly. That stood on many local foundations. That stood on uh, uh, laws that had been enacted to regulate the telegraph and the, uh, um, you know, going back to the 1840s. And that stood, and so, and then that was later updated, Interstate Commerce Act was later updated, Man Elkins, 1910 which like said, oh, this actually also applies to communications platforms. So these laws are, to a large extent, still in, they are in force today. There's been a lot of clutter built up on top of them. We need to brush away that clutter. We need, to, it's like when the DOJ is looking at this issue, when, when judge, uh, you know, uh, when, when the court is looking at this issue, uh, it's, you know, we need to get back to first principles and that these are essential communications platforms and we need to treat them as such. And that means treating them as a form of common carrying, and applying various forms of non-discrimination rules so that they treat every user on both sides of the market the same. Every, every sort of citizen who is seeking to read something, seeking to, 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 you know, buy something, and every person who is see, say, uh, seeking to speak to, uh, with other people and seeking to sell something. On both sides, you have to treat everyone the same. Equal justice before the law and the political economy, we translated that into equal treatment, equal service by the, mon uh, the essential monopolist. I, and just the, I mean, a lot of things I've heard, I, I covered tech in the 90s, I've kind of covered it through doing antitrust. I always hear from the tech community, you know, these antitrust, these steam-powered antitrust laws from the 19th century, so on and so forth. They can't really keep up with what we're doing. We're doing something new. This is outside, so on and so forth. It's fair to say from this panel, emphatic no, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, just, you know, it's like, uh, th these are some fundamental principles that we can take back to Roman times, to Babylonian times, to biblical times. <laughs> no, you know, that's important. You know, and it's like, and we, you know, we have, uh, it's like the, in the United States, the ideal is the postal service, the models, telegraph, telephone, okay. particular layers of wireless, satellites, uh, the internet itself, there's analogs and transportation and water and power and gas services. You know, in every instance, the goal is not to have a master in the middle. The middle should be thin. It should be devoted to providing service, not to manipulation. These are manipulation machines, and that is because we did not apply non-discrimination rules to them. We are the idiot generation in our country. All right, well, I'm, to be fair to us, let's talk about maybe some of the idiocy that we might have seen in our country beforehand, perhaps. Uh, Chinese idiocy everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and we'll get to that. We'll talk about uh, the mutual across the Atlantic as well. Um, but why don't we talk about like maybe a little bit about the breakups in your view from, from uh, Barry and John that worked in this country and perhaps the ones that didn't. Maybe we can have like a, a thing like that and then I'd like to go to Europe. Sure. Mm. Is that all right? Yeah. Oh, so Barry, go ahead. Yes, um, you know, breakups that worked. Um, you know, I mean, I think the, you know, it, it, it's, um, I mean, AT&T, it was, you know, we, we have to remember there was, the first AT&T breakup was 1913, right. right? So that was actually the, that one really uh, worked. And that was like, you know what, you got two platforms, you can only have one. So actually, if we're looking at Google, they got what, how many platforms? 10, 12, right? So how about, you know what, maybe we have each one is one. You know, so we'll just, you know, that would be a good model for breakup is go back to the, 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 the decree in 1913. Yeah. Um, Which I, th I don't think that was on your list because that was probably, that was kind of a little bit outside the antitrust, straight antitrust mm -hmm. tradition. But a nice reminder, right, yeah. that antitrust law isn't the only um, axe in our bag of axes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, there have been some that worked, I think. Um, in addition to the 1913 decision, um, I think American Tobacco is a good example, right? Was it perfect? No. We were left with a cigarette manufacturing oligopoly for some seven decades, eight decades after that. 
but an oligopoly that worked at least better than the monopoly trust had worked. Um, some competition did break out almost immediately after the decree was issued. Um, and it was, a, it was a powerful, far-reaching decree, so that tells you something, right? Paramount, I think, was effective. Was it perfect? No. Did it cost DOJ a lot of resources to administer? Yes. Somebody did a study and said at one point, one-third of the division's total communications with the outside world at one point were all about this motion picture decree, trying to administer it. You know, these things are not necessarily magic bullets or panaceas, um, but that was an effective decree that gave, I think, paved the way for Hollywood as we know it, right? Um, Grinnell, another really powerful, really effective breakup. To give an indication of how far courts wanted to go and were willing to go back then, Grinnell's basically a combination of three companies. Courts below said, we got to break up these three companies. Supreme Court says that doesn't go far enough. One of them, on its own, had gotten some local monopolies, so we got to break those up too. I mean, that was an effective decree, right? Um, that really deconcentrated the market. So, you know, I think there's been some notable successes. It's when courts go bold, it's when enforcers go bold. Don't leave little monopolies in place and think you've solved the problem. Um, you know, and I think it's worth keeping in mind on the flip side of that. Oftentimes, things were just so slow. Um, that can do a case, yeah, that's right? The name. Alcoa is a good example of that. I think it just went on too long. And eventually we had to use some other tool, the war board, to, to, to deconcentrate the industry. That worked, right? But it wasn't the antitrust case that solved it. Um, so I think when we're thinking about something like ad tech, it's on a pretty accelerated pace. That is the exception historically. It's very unusual to look back at these cases. They did take a long time. It's worth keeping in mind. Just one real, you know, sort of addendum to that is, um, you know, Breakup wasn't necessary in a lot of these cases because the assumption was if you control an essential services, thou shalt not vertically integrate. You, there will be no conflicts of interest because we don't, we are not able to, we're not going to be able to figure out where the conflict of interest is. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to create an air gap between the essential service and everything else. There's going to be a marketplace there. So uh, and so a lot of you know that's we could say add to these breakups. There were hundreds of cases, maybe thousands of cases, where people would have integrated and they did not. Okay, fair enough. Well, I think we should go, let's go over to the other side of the Atlantic and let's talk about, we know that the EC has been grappling with Google and other uh, large tech platforms for quite some time. And I'll just ask you the basic question. Why hasn't um, the EC had its own conversations about breaking up Google? Well, thank you. Jeff, it's a pleasure to be here, and again, thank you, Teddy, for putting this event up. Um, by way of disclosure, because I'm someone who comes from the private sector, and I always do disclosure, I've worked uh, systematically against uh, adverse to Google and Facebook, and before, uh, in the last three years, I've done some work for Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, but that's in the past. Um, I think Europe is a useful example for, in fact, a poster child for how ultimately piecemeal behavioral remedies are not the way to go. Um, and indeed, as you say, uh, the Commission, but also the member states, have grappled with Google for the best part of the last 15 years. We've had some really high-profile cases. I remember coming here in the US around 2018. We just had the shopping decision on search. We just had the Android decision. Um, and feeling quite smug that we Europeans were actually moving. We are at least doing something. Aside from uh, fines, we had attempted to do some remedies. Um, six years later, the dial hasn't moved. Nothing has happened. Nothing has changed on the ground. And the reason uh, for the failure of these cases is, is really multiple. Of course, uh, they were silly cases in some sense. Uh, if you're going to go after search, you're not going to do a case on shopping. You're not going to go and do a case on comparison shopping. That's not the whole of search. It was, as always, in the case of the European Commission, driven by uh, priori prioritization is driven by the complainants you, are beat, you have beating down your door. So that was the case for all of the, all of the enforcement cases. So that was a, a, a bit of a silly case selection, and, and, and theories of harm were uh, puzzling uh, in some dimensions. But ultimately, what failed was the remedies. In the case of uh, both shopping and Android, 
what was adopted is this notion that somehow we do auction. That's cool. The economists tell us that auctions allocate resources effectively and sensibly. And then they did absolutely nothing. Because, of course, uh, a cease and desist uh, gives an enormous amount of leeway for companies to just kind of redo it by the back door. So really, the history there is uh, one of abject failure. And there is no other way of putting it. <laughs> so this is why when people say there are remedies that, you know, some partial success is better than nothing. Well, OK, you know, if your standard is so low, uh, let's <laughs> kind of go there. But um, of course, it's better they did these cases than not. But it is incredibly dismal where we ended up. So then, <laughs> because, because we had uh, this awareness that, uh, well, you know, antitrust enforcement doesn't work. And, and why, you, you know, to answer your question, why didn't, we, why didn't Europe consider, consider structural remedies? Senior competition officials, I'm quoting, have said, it's not in our DNA to break up companies. This is Europe. We are obeying. We don't do violent <laughs> stuff to, to companies. <laughs> and in particular, American companies, God help us if we were ever to touch them, because, of course, politically, it's unthinkable. But there is a narrative in Europe. And people have I've heard European officials straight-facedly say here, it's not in our DNA to break up company, whatever that means. So breakups are not really on the cards. They've never been on the cards for the commission. I don't want to steal uh, Tim Cowan's thunder. Later, he will talk about the UK. There are provisions in the UK. There is some history in the UK. Of course, BT is a history he lived personally. And of course, there are examples. But they're very limited. At the level of the European Commission, there's been no history, really, of breakups. Uh, again, the UK has done some, and we'll hear later, um, but very limited. So, you know, you have a rich past history, as we heard, of doing, doing this redesign of perimeter of companies, a reallocation of assets, which is ultimately uh, intended to change the incentives, because the reality is that uh, unless you intervene in ways that address the incentives, it doesn't change. And that takes me to the final point for the moment, which is having failed abysmally to uh, do anything on, on, on antitrust, then Europe said, OK, well, let's, let's kind of look over there. Let's do regulation. Regulation, um, from one point of view, I mean, frankly, you guys can't pass a law uh, in, this, in this space. But at least in Europe, we can. And so it is a symbol of democratic achievement that across the aisles, uh, the European Parliament passed this Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act, so they're there. But the reality is that the, the rules become a compendium of the failed antitrust cases of the past. So, you know, we did something a bit on self-preferencing, we did a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and then the rules become, thou shall not self-preference. And the leeway that companies have in, to, to in, an, in a regulatory dialogue with the regulator to um, just do a little bit, just because the incentives are paramount. You are just going to do what your shareholder uh, maximiz profit maximization problem di uh, imperative dictates. So fundamentally, there is this narrative coming out of the European Commission saying companies are not complying because they're malicious. They're not remotely malicious. They are profit maximizing. And if you're telling them, don't do that, will you? But you're not very prescriptive, and you're telling, not, not telling them exactly what they're not supposed to do. They will come once a month to play tennis with the European Commission and say, so what do you want us to do? Oh, well, you know, we don't know. You comply with the law. Oh, this is my understanding of the law. Um, OK, not quite. But you know, this game goes on forever, because of course, there is no detailed prescription. So you know. Frankly, regulation is well intentioned. Inten you know, the intentions are good, but I am very skeptical that it's going to deliver anything transformative. We are nibbling at the edges. There are these incredible castles, which are, I call them the Gormengas castle, the castles of big tech. And we Europeans are there like the plebs saying, please, scratching on the ramparts, let us in. And they say, who, the, who are you? I live here. Go off. Um, and and and, uh, and that's the reality of it. I can go on. But <laughs> well, and I'm going to ask you. Uh, I want to bring up some of this later. But I wanted to ask you, in your view, I mean, in, in, in what 
do you think is the best thing to do in terms of <laughs> what would you me. like to see? Well, I mean, the reason we are all here wringing our hands and discussing this is because, of course, there isn't uh, an obvious solution. I mean, uh, as John says, breakups uh, are not uh, easy. We can all kind of sit here and kind of design scissor sort of lines around the ways in which we'd like to break up Google. It is a very known uh, position that you need to sort of, a, a very widely held view is you separate Android from search and maybe YouTube, and then when it comes to ad tech, you split the ad exchange from the two other bits. So we have theories of how it can work. Um, will it work? Would it work? Would it be possible? It's a question. Of course, because everything else uh, up to here hasn't worked, one needs to think further. And there is, of course, a range of possibility that one could also experiment with. You can think about doing something to do with data. You can think about doing something with browser. You can do something with uh, you know, uh, various other components of the ecosystem. The reality, though, and I'll say just this, is that we fail because antitrust cases have tended to be, and necessarily have been, about one narrow form of conduct. So you are somehow uh, excluding because you're doing this thing. Imagine, not to talk about Google, in Europe we did the Android case only focused on Android. We didn't even look at the Apple contract. We didn't look. We didn't do the Android case. The search case was not about the contract with Apple. It never got mentioned. So if you do narrow cases which are narrowly about a form of conduct, then you do narrow remedies that are about that particular conduct, and the ecosystem remains intact. This is the problem we are grappling with. Either you snip at the point of control, all of them, or the ecosystem is going to reform. So. Right, and, and, and we should point out, obviously, that, the, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, the ecosystem theory, you've been the big proponent of it over in your. Well, because it's obvious to my proverbial cat that we are talking to <laughs> an ecosystem. You know, we are talking about assets which are effectively composed of multiple activities that are communicating with one another. And so, again, if you're doing, imagine the Apple case in Europe, 10 years. I was involved in that case, but I should say 10 years of investigation, and we ended up with a piddly order to Apple to allow Spotify to link out. That's it. <laughs> That's it. So if you are looking at that case, you think, well, what has happened? But because, because the concern of Spotify was the complaint, and, and the concern was that they were doing But we didn't tackle the, the App Store, for example. Am I correct, though, that, I mean, the second ecosystem theory, it's, it's not just kind of a, a side theory or whatever. It's actually, it, I remember hearing that it's actually the EC has been, in some merger cases, is looking <laughs> through the lens of the ecosystem theory. I think I might, I well, might be wrong to say Amazon, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, Amazon or robot. Well, example. we are seeing, I, I would rather say that, I mean, what I've seen in the US, I mean, the case, the, the Amazon complaint that uh, John has been involved in, yeah. and, and the, app, um, the Apple complaint that the DOJ has issued are, in my view, attempts to take a a group of conducts and essentially present a problem which is not just narrowly you're doing this little thing wrong and we'll address that little thing. In Europe, yes, in mergers, there's been a little bit of noise around that, but it isn't really in any way articulated rationally or explicitly. It's kind of a nascent kind of stuff. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I know just through my, you know, looking at this world for years, um, and I wanted to ask, direct the next question to Barry. One of the things, I, I call it the T-1000 problem. I don't know if anybody saw Terminator 2, where basically you shoot them, they break apart, and then they reconstitute themselves. That seems to be, to me, in some of the breakups that haven't worked, one of the problems. And I thought maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about this so-called T-1000 problem when you're with the company and making sure that, like, okay, we do the breakup, but then... Uh, but it, it, you, know, you could say with AT and T, they were they've been reconstituting themselves for years. Yeah, but that's also because AT and T, 1982, that was a legacy of the previous era, which uh, you know the Reagan people said, well, sure, let's you know let this go through, uh, and then they immediately essentially suspended antitrust enforcement. So. <laughs> you know, that's well, of course, you, uh, right? You know, <laughs> it's like you mean we get to that was fake, you know? So. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I, and, I, and I think the, the, the key thing is actually, is, is going back to what I was saying before, you know, it's like the, if, if you remain vigilant afterwards, if you have established really good, uh, uh, solid uh, uh, merger guidelines, merger guidelines that include, as we have had traditionally, very strong sort of uh, uh, like a rule of four, rule of five, you know, sort of just uh, straight up limitations on, on, on horizontal merger. Uh, you know, which is, we're not quite there yet. I mean, I, I love the new guidelines, but, you know, it's like they can be further strengthened. And, I, you know, that's one of the things that we will be looking for in a, uh, you know, in a, in a Harris administration is a further strengthening of the guidelines. But so what, that's, you know, uh, that's how we traditionally pre prevented it. So what we have seen, this is something that the other side likes to throw at us. It's like, well, what do you do? Well, actually, you just keep doing what you were doing before. You know, so uh, you don't suspend antitrust, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's what allows people to rejoin. Uh, and uh, but the, you know, the key thing, again, is is actually sort of applying when you end up with something that is a platform, that is an essential platform, provides essential services, an essential network. We need networks. Networks are good. You don't necessarily want to chop the network up. The axe is the wrong tool. And that's when you apply these other sets of rules and that's you know and so that's really the uh, uh, the key thing is actually you want uh, and that's the missing part of this debate up to this point i wanted to say something that would be maybe a little uninformed but is it fair it sounds like what you're saying to me is that like you're almost treating these things as utilities of course right is that they're utility like yeah. Yeah. okay I mean, yeah. utility like yeah. all right so are there laws that i mean obviously under like uh common carrier and so on and so forth, but also like utility laws that could actually be helpful here, or is that going too far? Uh, if you want to use, I mean, th there's a big debate going on in Europe about sort of, you know, public infrastructure approaches to, you know, solving some of these problems. Uh, you know, this idea that there's a straight uh, sort of division between, you know, public, I mean, we got uh, 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 Amtrak is, is, is public, other railroads are private. Amtrak, as bad as it is, is actually uh, less bad than the privately run ones. Uh, so um, it's a, um, uh, you know, so it, it, it's a, uh, there's a gazillion ways to get there, but you just, you focus on the principle and then you have, you know, uh, you know, 10 different legal regimes that you can get to a particular goal and, you know, using a, uh, using a particular set of principles. The goal is neutrality and, the, you know, and there's a, you know, a, and there's a, a set of tools that will allow you to get there. Uh, so it's like, go through this door, go through this door, go through this door. Just go through one of the doors. <laughs> okay. And did you want to comment on what they're doing in Europe in terms of this? Well, the uh, conversation in Europe now is uh, actually driven by uh, not just the notion of how do we tame big tech and American big tech. I mean, this is, this is a broader conversation because Europe is finding itself at the beginning of a new mandate for the European Commission. We just had elections in Europe. We avoided the, the worst. The, the fear was that there was going to be a big swing to the right. It didn't happen. So we have a new mandate. And now policy is being designed. But the thing that has dawned on Europeans now at the policy level is not only that Europe is in a state of, of real trouble uh, in terms of flatlining growth, in terms of not going anywhere, but the additional question around this communication infrastructure is that we don't own any of the stuff below what's visible. So we, when we talk about regulating or doing antitrust vis-a-vis -vis, uh, big tech, have been concentrating on sort of the app level, you know, the app store, the Amazon store, the search, and, and, and all of that. Below that, it is, as I say, beginning to dawn on Europeans that there is a huge infrastructure, which is data centers, which is cloud, which is cables under the sea, of which we own perfectly zero. Now, now, picture that one up. You were talking about it. You see, first, I mean, frankly, this is the biggest question for Europeans, because not only we are incapable uh, uh, to, to do something really radical that can address the power, but we also have a fundamental problem that we don't own any of the infrastructure on which digital Europe works. And so this is way beyond regulating, way beyond doing a piecemeal case. So there is a big discussion just now starting about 
well, how do we, you know, we have this castle and the inhabitant of the castle looks down and says, off you go. And we are having to do something else which is democratic and hopefully involves um, an industrial policy around this. This is a bigger conversation, but frankly, we in Europe have be become open, have made ourselves entirely open to the entire vertical dominance of American big tech in exchange for defense dollars. You know, does one need to say it? That's what it is. It said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I wanted to pivot just a little bit and go back, because we, we talked a little bit about the, what I call the 2 1000 problem. Um, and John, I was going to ask you about the thing you brought up about time. This seems to be another thing that I find is, is uh, these cases take forever, it seems, um, for better or for worse. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And you're saying, like, this ad tech seems to be on the fast track here and kind of how that got that way. And then also, I wanted to also ask you about, like, uh, you know, your former agency, the FTC Act. There's some, I, I'm reading it, and there are a lot of interesting things in there. So maybe you can start off with time and then go into the FTC Act. Sure. Um, so, time. Uh, <laughs> big topic. The ad tech case is on what I think all of us in modern antitrust would say is a pretty fast clock, right? Um, and that's true when you look historically, too. There was no time, like I said, when courts seem to move really, really quickly. If anything, you can go back historically and find antitrust cases that moved much slower than some of the big cases today. So uh, people talk about, oh, FTC v. Facebook, it's taking a long time. It's even a different company now. It's meta, right? In the grand scheme of things, that one's moving right along. Right? There have been antitrust cases. The Paramount cases, DOJ had to fight through, I think it was 11 years, um, a war. <laughs> I think three different consent decrees that didn't work to finally get some relief. Um, so yeah, the antitrust cases can take a long time, but, and this is important, they don't have to. Uh, there are precedents out there that even in a case like ad tech, I think could be instructive. So you go back to, um, go back to American Tobacco. Once the judge had decided liability and issued the remedy order, judge gave the companies three months. Said, all right, you've got to dissolve your existing company You've got to spin yourself off into two um, operating companies. You've got to create a new corporation. You got three months to do it. They did it, right? And it worked wonderfully, right? <laughs> well, did it go far enough? I would say maybe not, but it worked really well. Um, so I would say, yeah, when DOJ is thinking about how long should we be pushing for here, there are some precedents out there uh, where courts did move quickly, even though the norm has been to move really slowly. Um, thinking about the toolkit then, kind of pivoting to, what can we do here? Um, another nice thing when you look back at antitrust history that emerges is the case law sets a really wide degree of latitude in the US for what you can do. Um, so say using Christina's castle metaphor. And she picked that, I'm sure, because defendants love to talk internally about their wonderful castles they've built, right? Um, pretty common when you start prying open a monopolist documents to find references to their castle. What should you do when you find a castle? Well, they've got like catapults inside, right? They've got hot lava they can dump on you. They've got a moat out front. And I think what Christine is describing is like, okay, they've been firing the catapult at us. Let's issue a rule that says no more catapults. Okay, they're just gonna start dumping the hot oil on you, right? <laughs> Not gonna work. Um, so what would an effective remedy look like? Looking back at the wide variety of things that courts have played around with in the US, something like this, I think. We're taking away your catapults. No more catapults. And you can never buy another catapult, right? You can't operate, to Barry's point, in that line of business anymore. We're taking away the moat. Sell the moat to somebody else who doesn't own a castle and has, to Christina's point earlier, different incentives. Right? We're also not going to leave your castle intact. Even if you built your castle honestly, you've now misused it. We're going to smash down the wall, the front wall, right? We're going to let people in. And I never thought I'd say this. I may be a little to the left of Barry on something. Even a network <laughs> can be broken up, right? You're not necessarily going to lose all the benefits of scale. Your king can't be employed by this kingdom anymore. Go work somewhere else. Go F off to the beach. You've made enough money. Right? <laughs> these are all, uh, speaking metaphorically, these are all real orders that judges have granted in real cases. So that gives me some hope. You know, there's some real, uh, real, um, wide wide freedom, wide latitude, and there are some, maybe some unused tools to think of the FTC Act. Um, it has a couple of interesting provisions that let, for instance, a judge appoint the commission to investigate and report on what the remedy should be, 
I don't know that that's ever been used before, but that could be an interesting idea, right? We've got a body of experts here. Let them take a look. Kind of independent, right? They're not litigating the case. And issue a non-binding report that the court could use if it wants to. So yeah, I think a lot of freedom and maybe even some tools we haven't used yet. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to go back to a point that Barry mentioned the word data, and, da and maybe you could, um, I, I thought that was a very interesting point. If you could just kind of uh, go a little bit further that, like, because that, again, this is a thing that I often hear from people who are like, there shouldn't, you know, the, you know, the antitrust laws, you, you shouldn't be looking to break up these tech companies because they, they, these old laws don't understand things like data. I'm not, I'm just saying that we've all heard this argument. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? And, and it's obviously an important topic. Yeah, and it actually, it should have been in the new merger guidelines, and it was cut out, um, but because people couldn't quite get there. Uh, but it's a, um, you know, so, um, you know, obviously, the, the amount of data that Google collects, uh, you know, as a first party and through, you know, various other ways of collecting data, gives it an enormous, it's one of the, the powers uh, that it uses to, to maintain its power, one of the advantages it used to maintain its power and to build its power and to chase away any potential rivals. Uh, you know, I mean, one thing about the, you know, we have tended to look at the data inside these corporations as their property, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, if we, uh, uh, in the past, uh, one of the things that say, you know, there's a couple ways to deal with this. One is you actually neutralize the data and you just leave it locked away, but it's neutral, it doesn't have value. Uh, common carrier law actually neutralizes data, the value of the data. It's you, you know, so you could collect data. You know, if you're a railroad in 1890, you can collect data. You can know everything about each person along the line. But if you're not allowed to manipulate everybody along the line, the data is a, is a, goes from being a value to your corporation, it becomes a cost. You know, you have to, you know, just storing it and, you know. So, so if you can't use the data, the data has no value, and then the, the race for data. So that's one way that we, we have traditionally dealt with it. You know, com, uh, Interstate Commerce Act, arguably the first pro, uh, major privacy, federal privacy law. Uh, another way of looking at the data today that, say, Google has is that it, it ain't the goddamn data, uh, property of, of Google. That data belongs to us. And, and now, I'm, I'm not making a John Lanier argument here. I'm not saying that it belongs to, you know, Christina and John and me, and we should all be, like, selling our data for, like, $79.81 uh, every year. It's like that. No, no, no. That's a, that is an entire, that's a red herring argument. That's, that's you know. Um, but uh, the data in the aggregate belongs to the public. The data, it's like, this is data, because we are, when we drive along the roads today, the government is not really, they get a little bit of data about us driving along the roads. Google gets every single thing we do when we drive along the road, everything. Stores it in their vaults. Uh, that data is of enormous value to the public. Um, traditionally, go back 50 years ago, no corporation had that kind of uh, cache of data. The public had that data, and we could use it for public purposes. So one of the uh, things, since these are essential facilities, since they are uh, uh, types of utilities, since they are, you know, sort of uh, uh, communications and transportation uh, uh, platforms, um, this data, by all traditional uh, standards, belongs to us communally. That doesn't mean that, that uh, uh, Julia Angwin uh, last week in the Times wrote a piece that, well, we got to figure out how to open this data to rivals. Not necessarily. We don't necessarily have to open the data to rivals, but we should make sure that the data is absolutely open to in certain, to you know, in, with very careful uh, uh, controls to government, to the state, to private researchers for certain public interest purposes. And, and we should also perhaps say, Google, you have to get in line to have access to this data with everybody else because it ain't your data. I, you, yeah, I was yeah, I mean, this is something which uh, is uh, is live in Europe. It's a discussion that's been had for some time. And interestingly, the, 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 the impulse is coming not from the Commission, really, which has been historically quite blind to these issues, but more at the local level. There is quite a lot of work in Europe at the level of municipalities. There is a sense that, as Barry said, the data are commons. Effectively, we should think of data as common. So there are cities in Europe, uh, Barcelona and, uh, and others, which have actually 
put in place these ideas so the data that is collected is actually used for public services. Of course, not the Google data, but there is a vision of data as commons. And very much like Barry says, the aspiration ought to be to broaden this, this, this kind of vision to a fundamental one. The data is indeed common property. And I think personally should be open also to others through APIs because, of course, if you are an SME trying to sell a service, you could benefit from access to that data. It should not be just, of course, it's important that the state and the municipality and the, and, and the local entities have got access to it and produce uh, services that we as citizens want. But no, I mean, the data is a collection of things that others can kind of build on. And so uh, this, is, this is certainly one of the ways in which one needs to think about remedies. Because, I mean, we are, we, are, we are thinking now breakups because, of course, there is the complete exasperation with anything else before that didn't follow or that didn't work. But in between, do nothing, do very little, just tell them off and break up. Of course, there's a, a collection of other things that needs to be absolutely done at the same time. And as well, because let's face it, even a breakup will take a significant amount of time. What do we do in the meantime? And it is one of the reasons why it is a pity that you, Europe, thinking about regulation, pivoted entirely into quasi-antitrust uh, regulation. The rules of regulation are not in Europe effectively embracing. The, 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 we didn't go the direction of common care essential facility at all. We went into the direction, let's kind of compress the antitrust rules into some sort of exante, synopsis exante of what the antitrust rules should be. You know, the same problems you face for, 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 for decades with antitrust are being faced here, the incentive problem. John, do you want to weigh in on the data issues? Um, wow, <laughs> there's a lot there. I mean, I, maybe if I could just step back just a little bit, I think Christina brings up an interesting point at the very end that like, if it kind of feels like we've been here before, you know, I think we have been as a country. Um, when I look at something like the DMA, I, from a U.S. perspective, I think of the Clayton Act, right? We had some broad general laws in place, Sherman Act, 1890. Tried that out. Even though we got to some breakups, I think people weren't super satisfied. Said, well, let's try some more narrow targeted rules, see if that does the trick. You know, that had some initial success, and then I think people kind of felt like the courts walked back on the Clayton Act and eroded it and chipped away at it. Defendants came up with increasingly creative ways to get around it. And so then 1950, Congress acted again and doubled down on the Clayton Act, right? And I think we saw some real success there for a while. Um, but that's all to say, like, stepping way back, this all, I don't think anybody should walk into this discussion thinking, like, okay, I've got all the answers, we've got it all figured out. I think all of this is, has, has to be experimentation. And we just have to be okay with that, right? We just have to be okay with doing something that's big enough and bold enough to potentially work and not being so afraid that we'll, you know, touch one of the little, you know, cards that makes up Google's tower and just topple the whole thing accidentally, right? There just has to be, I think, a, 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 a confidence, I guess, a confidence to say that we'll try. I mean, the problem with uh, these, these uh, certainly in Europe, the, the antitrust cases we've had, by targeting one conduct, there's always this conundrum as an agency. You need to narrow down your case because somehow you need to prove it. You need to prove that there is a problem in that narrow, well-defined market, and the conduct is the one that's driving the problem. So that inevitably funnels you down to narrow sliver of problems that you think you can put your arms around. That has been the history in Europe. Um, that has been why in Europe, when what is staring at us in the face is that the problem is in many ways exploitation, exploitation of power, because we have more case history, case uh, precedent on exclusion, we fashion cases in the form of exclusion. Then you fashion cases like that, and then your remedy ends up being, well, how do you actually do some redlining of the contract to remedy that exclusionary feature of the contract, contract which is totally missing the entire point. And so, you know, bizarrely, a regulation which is effectively a version of that a version of the very things we are narrowly telling them exposed not to do only exactly is lending itself to all sorts of 
work around and delay and procrastination. Time, I mean, as John was saying, is an issue. Why do we, in Europe we take, you at least have to put things in front of a judge. We have an administrative system in which everything is grotesquely delayed because you send them five questions and they say we need six months to reply, of course, and everything is grotesquely pushed forward. And then the first decision by the commission takes 10 years, and then you have another eight years of appeals. Yeah. So, I mean, we cannot, this, this is dysfunctional. Do you, see a, do you see that obviously you're going to get a new competition com uh, uh, chief in uh, November? Uh, do you see that this is the opportunity, in your view, to, to, to get things expedited? I mean, expedited? it is going to be, this is of peace, but it is interesting to see what's going to happen to uh, competition in Europe going forward in the new mandate, because I think that uh, the chips are not going to fall exactly in the same way. There is now a big drive towards industrial policy. Yes. There is a hysterical debate uh, about whether industrial policy means national champions, and therefore we need to defend against that. But inevitably, it will be a focus on industrial policy. The perception is that the competition uh, directorate has not been particularly helpful in pushing forward industrial policy. It's been quite defensive. and. And, and focused on its own neoliberal view of the world. I don't know what the president of the commission will decide the shape of DG competition will be, the competences of DG competition will be. I think the, the, there is going to be some, some, some surprises. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that this idea of national champion industrial policy, they're coming together right now. And I, I was, Barry has written about this a lot, uh, at least the articles I've been in terms of industrial policy. Is it fair to say? I mean, in your view, and I don't. You tell me uh, if I got this wrong, but basically, in your view, industrial policy is absolutely essential. Um, you're not talking about that in terms of national champions. You're talking about in terms of, you know, uh, the, the way government interacts with business. Right? Uh, yeah, and but there's I mean, there's, and there's different goals of industrial policy. So you could use, your industrial policy could aim at national champions, right. you know. And alternatively, your, your industrial policy could aim at uh, the breaking of choke points. Yes. And so in the 1970s in France, it was aiming at industrial champions, you know, national champions. And the IRA, um, and you know, we talk about, you know, what Antitrust is versus anti-monopoly. IRA was, um, which you know, passed in 2022, uh, is one of the most important anti-monopoly actions in this country by Congress that we've seen in many decades. It was a choke point breaking action using using cash. So it's like you have these super choke points in Taiwan, super choke points in China. So we're going to use cash to break those choke points. We're going to build, because you can, we can start using tariffs and we can start using antitrust, but that's going to be really slow. We need to speed this process because this is an emergency. This is an emergency. So we're throwing a lot of cash at it. And, uh, and that was, that's been, it's, it's not done yet, but it's been enormously effective uh, at sort of breaking a lot of these choke points. We need to actually continue this. But it's like, but the key thing is that industrial policy, you know, it's like the idea that the private sector, the idea that private actors must always lead, um, you know, we want to create as much freedom for the innovator, for the new idea to get out there. That's what part of, a large part of this is. But sometimes the government must actually act in order to make that possible. I, I would, uh, I like very much the way that Tim Wu essentially characterizes this, this discussion. Competition policy is a form of economic policy and a form of industrial policy because competition agencies are in the position to decide on how assets are allocated. You want to merge? You want to combine these assets? Yes, no. We can do something about the way in which you, you behave yourself and ultimately even carve it out. So this is fundamental. It's a fundamental form of economic policy. This is a step that in Europe hasn't yet been made because we are still in the throes of a way of thinking of competition policy is this church, which does arcane things. So you have the economists and the lawyers doing their thing, and nothing ever changes because there is a thing which Moses put on his tablets which says, this is how we do competition, and that is imminent and will never change. But it is changing. It has changed here, and we are just late. 
that just lead to this. And you know, the same is true of, of, of competition policies uh, as a fundamental value that uh, inspires trade. This is a vision that in this country has been coming back. It was originally there. It has come back under, under, under this um, uh, administration. In Europe, it still isn't there. But, you know, for our purposes, the discussion, I mean, to John's point, take a step back. What are we doing? It's not just about knitting. Uh, it's not just about making small little bite-sized chunks out of these monopolies. It's more about the broad democratic structure and the way in which we power our own, other than uh, you know just the big uh, uh, monopoly entities, which incidentally are just not sort of privately owned. I mean, you know, to throw this in, China is a monopoly, which we worry about. Yeah, you have, you've all put it all very well. I think from our perspective, I mean, as, as, a, as a journalist, I see that over the, I've been covering uh, antitrust for a little over 10 years, and I've just always noticed that there's this real concern about meddling too much with business, better or for worse. And that, that there seems to be kind of what the three of you are saying is today is, you know, get your hands dirty. You, you can you can get in there you, and 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 be bold where you need to be bold. Is that a fair sum of, of what I'm hearing? Well, look, I mean, sorry, just you know, the the I do worry about meddling with business simply because business are smart. Okay, so you know they know where they are because they're stupid, and so if we try to redesign their product. Uh, you know, it is it is a concern. Are we going to do something that worsens the product as outside regulators? We are mandating some. I mean, I, I feel the pain. I know that. At the same time, the issue is we need to find a balance between that and and the way in which we are confronted with the castle. We have to understand there's different kinds of business, different kinds of yeah. entrepreneurs, and it's like it is monopoly is a violation of the liberty of the entrepreneur, of the business. You know, and it's like this idea that meddling with monopoly is meddling with business is upside down. Meddling with monopoly, breaking monopoly is good for every honest business person in the nation. It, uh, 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 Vice President Harris has been talking about opportunity economy. O opportunity is freedom. Oppor opportunity as freedom, you need anti-monopoly. And John, yeah, yeah. we talk about you actually, obviously when you got the FTC, brought several cases, uh, the, the Amazon case, and we could... Well, let me first say, yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> no, it was no, of course very not, good team. Were, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, I, th I think getting back to your question, Jeff, it's a really good one. I guess I don't, in getting back to the idea of is antitrust industrial policy, you know, I, I don't know, but what I do know is that antitrust is about channeling competition in certain ways. And this is why I don't, I, I don't love the, hey, let's get our hands dirty mm -hmm. metaphor. Because okay. mm -hmm. hey, not acting is channeling competition in a certain way, right? That is going to cause resources to flow in a certain direction. Acting is gonna cause resources to flow in a different direction, right? There's, there's no either or. You're doing industrial policy, if we wanna call it that, whether you're not acting, whether you're acting. And I think, you know, um, thinking about the FTC as a place, I said uh, we had a big team, very good team, a place that has a lot of expertise in acting, right? You know, I think it's a bit of a mistake to think we don't have anything to draw on from the last 20 years. We'd have to go all the way back to the cases I was talking about to learn anything. We just have to forget about the artificial silo between different anti-monopoly laws and say, hey, it's all part and parcel of the same enterprise. Anti-merger laws are part of our anti-monopoly toolkit. I know the FTC a little better than DOJ, so I'll use them. FTC has broken up companies in consummated merger challenges in this century, right? Um, you don't have to go very far back, 2018, I think the Autobot case consummated merger challenge, we break them up, it worked. Um, Ch Chicago Bridge and Iron, 2005, consummated merger, the companies that already combined, FTC went in, got an order to break them up, and the spun-off company actually ended up doing better than the original company, which was still trying to pursue mergers, eventually merged with somebody who dragged them into bankruptcy. Right? So yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of reject the getting our hands dirty metaphor and say, this is just about how we're gonna act, right? And we do have some expertise in this century currently at these agencies. Okay, I bought, uh, we're getting, I think, towards the end. Do I have a uh, time for... No right 
Okay. Questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. Uh, why don't I open it up? We have a little time. Go ahead. Uh, Christina, earlier you uh, suggested that the... Thank you. Uh, Christina, earlier you mentioned that the uh, European Union is driven by the complainants that come forward. You mentioned shopping and search. Um, so why don't complainants come forward to drive the agenda in, in Europe, in your opinion? The complainant that drive things forward tend to be American big tech companies in their own right. So you have often, not always, so who are the big complainants? Who are the ones sitting against Apple in the, in the discussion now? Matches? Epic, Spotify, okay, European. But fundamentally, you know, the case selection is driven by the complaint, and we know that. Uh, so, I mean, why don't they drive forward? They're SMEs, they're sitting there and saying, we've been told that this DMA is going to help us. We don't see how. Uh, they don't have the resources to go and fundamentally issue complaints. You know, the people with the money to pursue a case in front of the European Commission as complainants for 10 years are Spotify, are Epic, are these guys. Can actually, um, being a complainant can be really dangerous. One, you're going to attract retribution from the person you're complaining against. And two, you may actually get retribution from the government. A case in point. Uh, the uh, Apple eBooks case. The, the, I was very involved in that back going back to 2009, 2010. A bunch of publishers, independent publishers, went to the DOJ. They met with Gene Kimmelman, and uh, they said, "We got a problem here with, with Amazon. Amazon's business model is destroying us. Their power plus their business model, based on discrimination, destroying us." And Gene Kimmelman looked at him and said, "But." Amazon's driving down the price of books. That's just an absolute good that trumps all of the political problems of Amazon controlling you. So we're going to not actually, we're going to, one, not go after Amazon, and two, we're going after you. <laughs> hey, um, I'm Josh Gray from the law firm. I'm a lawyer, law firm, Kenny Knock Walter. I got a question which is probably for John, but anyone on the panel might weigh in on it, which is uh, I have an impression of looking at the history of breakups that the ones that produced the great social value, um, often the payoff was completely unexpected at the time of the breakup. It wasn't part of the design and couldn't have been because it wasn't foreseeable. And I, I think my sense of that comes from the 82 at t breakup where Bill Baxter and I'm sure others thought that the future will of microwave transmission for long distance. It was low capital cost. It was going to be competitive, and they wanted to create an environment uh, where you could at least have competitive long distance service, even if local service was going to remain a natural monopoly. Um, and then 10 years later, we have, you know, he basically laid the groundwork for the United States to quickly adopt the digital revolution. So we went from pots to pans and got the internet and, and a lot of investment that went with that, and it was tremendous for our economy. And I don't know the history of the the AT&T, the, the mandatory licensing one, uh, but it, you know, which was structural in the sense that it transferred property rights from AT&T to the licensees. But I, it's hard for me to imagine that they realized that they were creating Silicon Valley, IBM, and Texas Instruments at the time that they did that. Um, but based on your study of what's worked, um, is this sort of unforeseeability and unforeseen payoff a theme in the successes that we should be weighing when we think about the benefits of, of structural um, remedies. Yeah, um, I'll take a first crack at that. I'd love to hear what my panelists think as well. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've talked about Paramount a few times. I don't think the DOJ anticipated the extent to which the existing studios actually weren't the best people to be making movies. Like, they owned the physical plant, but it turned out that independent production companies were actually just better at making good movies. I don't think they anticipated that, but the decree ended up paving the way by just kind of breaking the studio's total vertical control uh, for independent production studios to rise up um, and gave rise to what, what I think film scholars would say is a real golden age of Hollywood, 60s and 70s. Um, so yeah, I think 
I think my friends at George Mason will often warn, they're very fond of warning, about unintended consequences. <laughs> Anytime the government acts, there's going to be unintended consequences. They always mean bad ones. There can be good ones. The semiconductor. Semiconductor is um, 19, um, was part of a policy. It was a result of a policy of breakup that we haven't even touched on, which is we were very literal in our thinking about breakup. After the, uh, in, the in the New Deal, um, Thurman Arnold and the, the government, they did this thing called the TNEC, which is a study of the, the entire economy uh, of consolidation. And they said, all these corporations, these dominant corporations have patents. They control all these patents. In a number of cases, their power, entire power is based on patents. So they established a policy which was then enforced between essentially 39, 1940, and about 1982, 83, which was for a, large corpor a lot of the large corporations, corporations that do not fit in the initial list of breakups, um, they were forced by the government to shed off patents. Uh, uh, IP. There's 90,000 plus patents were, were forced out of AT&T and RCA and IBM and you can go down, uh, 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 you know, Corning, you know, the, you know, just every part of our political economy. Uh, and it's like foundational technologies like the semiconductor that comes out of the uh, sort of raiding the, pa the, the patent vaults of AT&T. And, you know, <laughs> So it's like, that's a, there, that's a whole other form of breakup that we haven't even gotten into. Mm -hmm. And Just, actually, let's put that on the list of remedies for the DOJ, which is that they can like, yeah. you know, go after the goddamn patents of Google. Yeah. Now, patents is an, uh, something I wanted to mention because I don't know that we need to just uh, anticipate the, that, that the innovation will be in areas that we don't I don't care. Wherever they come from, is it from area I anticipate or I don't anticipate? The reality, though, is that there is a serious empirical work that has shown that after the AT&T consent decree and after the, AT the breakup of the baby bells, the number of patents from other than the company exploded. So the company itself had fewer patents, but this was massively compensated by a range of patents in, in, in other directions by others. So, uh, I mean, I don't know that we can sort of generally say that the greatest innovation came from where you didn't expect it, but generally there is uh, a big rise in innovation across the board. The, the patterns, it's my observation is that Duncan tells that uh, that pattern is historically accurate. It's a strong argument for structural remedy lucky if it does what it was intended to do. It may be able to produce an unexpected benefit, but it's even more unlikely to be able to do that. It won't. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the, the genius of changing structure, which is you know, even, even halfway right, is you're setting the stage for well, absolutely. You are severing the incentive of the behavior that creates the problem, and you're opening up to everyone else. Yeah, this is, our, on paper, the benefit. It's our, it, we might even Well, I mean, to Barry's point, monopolies are, are illegal, yeah. uh, or should be. Okay, Teddy. Uh, we've talked a little. We've talked a lot about um, remedies that would work, structural rules. Can you talk a little bit about tempting behavioral remedies that will, wouldn't work and why they won't work? Just like, you know, or you know, things you expect the the company Google to propose that, you know, uh, that wouldn't work. I, that could be. Well, again, sort of reaching into the bag of European things that <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> um, you know, the choice screens, yeah? We expect that to be somehow on the books uh, because, of course, and this is the big question, what will Judge Meta do in the remedy stage? Will he just kind of do redlining of the contract and say Google can no longer pay Apple for this, uh, for this kind of default position to which Apple will say, I don't care. I'll find another way of getting money from Google, and I'll use them as default anyway because everything else sucks. Um, will they say, well, will the judge say, we'll have a choice screen? 
Look at the history of choice screen. This is why at the beginning I was saying uh, Europe got itself befuddled by economists kind of suggesting that we should do auctions. So in the third, in the shopping case, there was a proto, very simplistic auction for getting into the, 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 the box, the Google box. In the Android case, the idea was we're going to have a choice screen and companies will have to pay Google to appear in some order on that choice screen. I mean, the, the, ma the madness of this kind of uh, really is, is something to behold. But the reality is that you opened up your, your, your phone and you had a, a potentially a choice only on a, a Android phones, by the way, because, of course, we hadn't done the case. Uh, involving Apple, so nothing happened on the Apple side. So if you had your Android phone, you had a choice screen, and you had, uh, you know, Google search, Ecosia. I mean, you know, things people had never heard of, and nobody chose. So yes, there are studies that suggest that if you design the choice screen in a way that might be more attractive to people, more people. But the, 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 there is now under the DMA an obligation also on Apple to put a choice screen. And it hasn't moved the dial. Okay? It, has, it probably changes one, two percentage point in the search proportion. So these things are tempting. And my fear is that the judge will just say, well, I've identified a narrow problem, which is the contracts. We will kind of basically prohibit those exclusivity. And we'll also add up a, a choice screen. And that will be. Just nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe throw in there um, writ, unbundling writ large without really strong guardrails around how that's done. I think that's another European uh, grab bag of tricks that didn't work super well with Microsoft. I've heard, I've heard a rumor at least that there are like 100 copies of this unbundled Windows. Yeah. They all reside Absolutely. in DG Comp <laughs> lawyers' <laughs> <the> offices. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a fun uh, <laughs> trinket. Yeah, so that, you know, maybe unbundling, it can work. You know, to Barry's point, this idea of, like, non-discriminatory dealing requirements, they, they can work, but not just a simple, you know, open-ended order. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Good. I think we're good? Thank you, Thank you all. Very lively. Actually, wait. Oh. Can we actually... Uh, I just want to, you know, last point. This is the final point. We should remember what is at stake when we're dealing with Google. We actually had, we hosted, Open Markets hosted an event. Christina was there, actually Teddy was there, uh, June 27th, and it was about the press, the, the you know, the, 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 the health of our democracy. Google is a threat to our democracy. They have shut down the ability of, in, in California, they have actually just struck a dirty, corrupt deal with, 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 with uh, uh, Governor Newsom. <laughs> they, they leverage that by shutting down the people's ability to share news with each other. Um, you know, so one of the things that we, at this event that we had across the way, we had Margaret Vestire speak. Now, Margaret Vestire, I agree with, with, with Christina. There's a lot she could have done, should have done, might have done. Uh, one thing she did leave as a challenge to enforcers here in the United States and to this court and to the next commission is she said the danger today that we face because of big tech is one of tyranny. That came out of Margaret Vestire's mouth, the word well, tyranny. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you all again. Thank you.